A 25% tariff would be devastating for the auto industry in Canada. But then it would also be devastating for the U.S. for the U.S. workers as well because Canada would be forced to retaliate. So you're looking at a situation where nobody will buy any North American built cars, candidly. Um, U.S. workers will suffer massive layoffs. Why? Because 60% of all parts that go into Canadian assembled vehicles come from the United States. The number one export market for vehicles from the United States is Canada. So why Donald Trump would shoot himself in the foot and more importantly, American workers doesn't make any sense. The only winner in that type of an exchange will be the cars that are imported to the United States from Japan, Korea. They already are selling about two million vehicles a year in the U.S. market or the U.S actually sells no vehicles to those markets at all. So why would you want to hurt yourself and benefit markets or benefit countries that you have no access to in the first place? It doesn't make a stitch of economic sense, but unfortunately at this point in time, one can argue that Trump is strictly arguing politics. How many of your members are employed by American automakers? Well, the auto industry in Canada, we have 40,000 assembly workers, about another 80,000 in the auto parts workers. The lion's share I represent. If you take a look at the United States, between auto and auto parts, you're looking at almost a million direct jobs. So this will have a significant impact on both of our economies. And frankly, the whole threat about the tariffs is rather, frankly, doesn't make a stitch of sense. Meaning you don't think it's actually going to happen or uh, you're afraid that it could happen and would hurt? Well, it could happen, it could hurt, but I'm not going to predict what Donald Trump is going to do. I'm not convinced anybody can really do that. But ultimately, this would be foolish for Americans, it would be bad for American jobs, it would be bad for American consumers, it would be devastating for workers on both sides of the country. So nobody thinks this is a winning strategy. Clearly, Donald Trump may be the only person that thinks this makes sense. Coming into this latest phase of the negotiations with Canada following that agreement in principle between the U.S. and Mexico, there was some talk that many of those provisions agreed to with the, the North American content of cars, for example, and also the, uh, the kind of minimum wage standards for auto workers would be very much amenable uh, to Canada. And therefore, maybe there was a head start in having Canada sign on. And uh, that's not enough at this point? Well, first of all, the, the changes made for the auto industry I will argue, really go a long way to benefit Canadian and American auto workers. And frankly, it'll help Mexican auto workers hopefully raise their wages so that they can actually afford to buy a car that they build. So was it significant? The answer is yes. But there's much more to the trade deal than just the auto industry. So if I'm looking at it from a Canadian-American point of view based on today, that is important, but overall it's only one piece of the puzzle. We cannot accept a trade agreement that doesn't have a fair dispute mechanism. We're not going to allow the U.S. ITC to be the sole determining factor and then have to wait years and years and years in order to get a ruling from the WTO. If I take a look at the softwood lumber dispute, the Trump administration has slapped about a 25% tariff on softwood lumber imported to the United States. All that really has done is drive up the cost of new homes in the United States thousands and thousands of dollars. So Canadian workers haven't been negatively impacted. The only people who are negatively impacted are American consumers. And why the Trump administration would penalize his own citizens doesn't, once again, just doesn't make any economic sense. Yeah, we have, uh, we've been watching uh, certainly what lumber's done to input costs for home builders and what home builders' uh, stock prices have done. If all of what you're saying is true, though, why do you think the Mexicans were so uh, quick, arguably, uh, to cut a deal and we're willing to take part in that uh, rather uh, uh, gracious conference call earlier in the week. Well, because I think Mexico realizes that they had to concede the most. Uh, Mexico, frankly, got the better end of the stick for the last 24, 25 years, and they realized that any deal was going to have to address some of the major contentious issues. I mean, the whole renegotiation of NAFTA started over shuttered auto plants um, in the United States as a result of the cheap wages of auto workers in Mexico. I believe that these pieces have been resolved. But Mexico needs the U.S. market, needs the Canadian market in order to have any sort of a successful economy. So they couldn't deny the fact that they got the better end of the deal. Canada closed four auto assembly plants. The United States closed 10. 
They opened eight in Mexico. They're opening two more in Mexico. And the BMW plant that's opening next year is going to pay the workers $1.10 an hour. So it's pretty clear to see why there was a straight migration of jobs from Canada, the United States to Mexico. But auto isn't the only air industry. There is aerospace. There is, we can walk through so many other industries that have been negatively impacted. So Mexico had to give up the most. Why? Because they ran, a, 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 frankly, an industrial strategy and policy that siphoned good paying manufacturing jobs from Canada and the United States.